Okay, we're going to introduce managerial accounting today. This is our first lecture, and in this lecture, we're going to introduce the key terms that we're going to use throughout this course, as well as look at some formulas that we're going to need in order to prepare financial information. Now, even though this is managerial accounting, we still draw on the information we learned in our financial accounting class. Hopefully you had that class or else you may be run into some problems uh, with some of the stuff we cover here. The first thing we want to do is we want to kind of compare and contrast the difference between financial accounting and managerial accounting. Now financial accounting, the focus is on preparing financial statements for what we call external users. These are people like the creditors, the people we owe money to, the banks, the vendors, okay, the government, um, shareholders, unions, taxing authorities, okay, uh, customers who we have a big business transactions with. A lot of different third parties need to see our financial information. As a result, we have to follow very strict guidelines, and we call those guidelines GAAP, G-A-A-P, which is short for Generally Accepted Accounting Principles. These are the rules of accounting that all companies have to follow, or else uh, it would be very difficult to compare company A to B, G General Motors to Ford, uh, Hewlett Packard to Dell, Kellogg's to Quaker Oats, or any other company in similar industries, not to mention if we're allowed to switch the rules whenever we want to, then we can't even compare this year for our company to last year for our company. So GAAP provides very rigid guidelines in preparing financial information so that the information is reliable and ultimately people can use it to make decisions. Okay, so the focus is on financial measurement and financial information, and all companies prepare an annual financial statement. Most prepare quarterly, and most even prepare monthly financial statements, but they're at defined period of, uh, periods of time. Managerial accounting, on the other hand, is designed for internal use, for management and the employees, and we're evaluating the performance of our company, how efficient we operate, how effectively, economically we operate, as a result, we don't have to follow GAAP. We can put reports in whatever format we want. We can prepare them as frequently as needed. And you know, restaurants will prepare hourly reports on traffic flows, for example. It doesn't have to be financial information. It can be non-financial information. Okay, so airlines uh, have reports on on-time departures, on-time arrivals, lost bags. Companies have customer satisfaction measures. Um, UPS, how many, how quick it takes to deliver a package. You saw that movie uh, with Tom Hanks from Federal Express, how they measure the importance of measuring how fast it gets there because that's their business. So reports uh, can be financial, they can be non-financial, you can produce them annually, monthly, weekly, daily, hourly, as frequently as you need in order to get the feedback you need to run your department and to run your business uh, as as profitably and as efficiently and effectively as possible. Management accounting generates reports for the entire company and these are our primary goals when we talk about managerial accounting and the reports we produce. First, it helps us plan to develop goals and objectives for the company. Then we turn them into budgets for financial information. For example, we start with a sales forecast. What do we think demand for our product or products is going to be? What will be our sales budget? How much are we going to try to sell? From that, we develop all sorts of operating budgets. Our production budget, how much do we need to produce if we're a manufacturing company? How much are we going to buy if we're retail? How much is our labor budget going to cost? How much are we going to incur in terms of labor costs, buying inventory, uh, overhead costs? So we have all sorts of budgets which we develop in the planning stage. Okay? Managerial accounting reports help us to run our business day to day. That's what we mean by directing, managing day to day operations, making sure that all the wheels are running smoothly and if one of the wheels is wobbling we fix it and if it's squeaking we oil it and make sure everything's moving as smoothly as we are capable of making it run. Controlling relates to directing. This is the feedback process and this is where all these reports come in and they come in as, as frequently as necessary so we can see okay here's where we want to be going, are we heading in that direction? Are we running into any problems? A lot of times, the way you know there's a problem is you get feedback. 
do these reports. Say, whoops, we're spending more than we should have been. Or we're doing something, we're using more materials than we should have. Or we're having too many breakdowns of the machines. Or the raw materials are, are um, causing problems with the machinery. Any number of scenarios. But we get this feedback, and that allows us to fix whatever problem may exist so that we can continue running on course. Okay? Every company should have a goal of continuous improvement. I mean, there are times when a, a good manager knows when to back off, hands off, let, let a smooth running operation continue, but over the long haul, you're always looking for how can we make things better, ultimately save money, improve our product, improve the processes that we use, and so continuous improving, improvement. And ultimately, all of this implies the importance of sound decision making. Now, this is where good quality and timely reports come in. And timely means producing them and getting them in the hands of people who need them in time to make decisions while they can. Getting it three months later doesn't do me any good if we're way off course. We have to produce these things not only accurately, but in a timely fashion. OK, now, time to introduce what I call the key players in this course. We have three product costs, materials, labor, and overhead. OK, now, I tend to abbreviate raw materials, which I usually would just put RM, enter production. OK? And in the production process, we add labor and manufacturing overhead. OK? So we add labor and overhead. And while we are manufacturing or producing our product, we call this work in process, which I abbreviate WIP. OK? Now, I didn't leave myself quite enough room, so I'm going to have to shorten my arrows. When we are finished producing, we have something called finished goods, or FG. And then ultimately, when we sell our inventory, it becomes cost of goods sold. And I put a dotted line here because this is where our product costs end up on the income statement in cost of goods sold. And we're going to see an income statement towards the tail end of this discussion. All right, now, these three types of inventory, raw materials, work in process, and finished goods, are inventories, which means they're assets, and they will go on the balance sheet. OK, now, we further break down materials between direct and indirect. And there's a real easy way to think of it. Let's take a look at a chair. I'm going to bring this chair into view here. And I'm not going to lift it up since it's a little big and heavy, but we see that we have fabric, we got all this padding, we have these armrests, we got the braces, we got legs, we got co uh, the uh, ca coasters, whatever those things are called. And so we've got a lot of pieces, and what constitutes the bulk of this product is direct materials. What's a little harder to see, and sometimes harder to measure, is the thread that we use in this seam here. And we may have some adhesive, some glue, which helps to secure uh, some of these parts on here. Little fasteners, tiny little screws and nails, OK? As well as lubricants to help run the machines that help to cut these pieces and manufacture these pieces. OK, and so the indirect materials, which generally speaking are lubricants, fasteners, adhesives, that type of thing, are harder to, you don't really see them. They're harder to measure how much we use. And so we lump them into a category called indirect materials. Okay, and, and we draw a distinction there, and it's an important distinction in terms of how we evaluate our costs, measure performance, et cetera. Okay, so materials get broken down between direct materials, which is the main parts of a product, and the indirect materials, which is the little stuff. The, the axle grease to keep the machines running that cut the parts into the proper sizes, the, the lubrication that keeps the machines running, fasteners, adhesives, et cetera. Okay? A little more difficult to measure how much we use per product, 
So we evaluate how much we use and measure it in a different fashion. And we'll continue that to talk about that in a moment. Then we have direct and indirect labor. And think of the factory. When in managerial accounting, when you see the word factory or plant, this is where we make the product, okay? And so any cost associated with the factory or plant are product costs, okay? If we see the office or headquarters, or we see the store where we sell our product, these are operating expenses Okay, and we're going to account for them a little bit differently. So these are some of the terms you want to hang on to as we progress in this course. Because we draw a distinction between product costs and our operating expenses, which we refer to as period costs. I'm going to come back to that in a little bit. So we have three primary product cost categories. Materials, materials we break down between indirect and direct. Labor, same thing, indirect and direct and then overhead. Now labor, I want to go back to labor for a second. These are the people who build the product. Think of an assembly line. Think of like an automotive assembly line. The people who are building the product, attaching parts and screwing things down and welding and spray painting and doing whatever it is they're doing, those are your direct laborers, okay? And then you have the supervisors and you have the mechanics who keep all the machine running. And you have other employees who work in the factory. Believe it or not, the cleaning crew comes in at night. The security guards who keep an eye on the place so they don't get vandalized. These are all indirect laborers because they're not building the product, but they work in the plant or the factory, so they're related to the production process. If we weren't producing a product, we wouldn't incur those costs. And those are called indirect laborers. And again, we count for them a little bit differently. The area that gets the most attention, which is the most problematic, is overhead. And let's look at the definition of overhead. All other production costs other than direct materials and direct labor. And notice I included indirect materials and indirect labor because we're going to put the indirect material costs, indirect labor costs in the overhead account first. And in a subsequent lecture, we're going to see how we account for these costs. Depreciation on the factory, depreciation on all the machines and equipment, utilities, the electricity, gas, water, the insurance we pay on the factory, the property taxes for the factory, cleaning crew, security guard, those are my, some of my other examples I tend to use quite a bit. Any other costs we incur might be training costs for people to do their job better in the factory. Those are all lumped into the overhead category. Okay, so any cost associated with the factory that isn't direct materials, direct labor, is by definition overhead, and those are our three product costs, materials, labor, and overhead. Okay, so that's very important that you understand that information. Now, I made reference to this a moment ago, product costs versus period costs. Let me step over here. Our product costs, materials, labor, and overhead, work their way through production Okay, and while we're producing the inventory, it's, it goes on the balance sheet. Product costs are inventory costs because we debit accounts that ultimately end up in inventory. Okay, so materials, labor, and overhead go through work and process, and if the whistle blows at 5 o'clock on December 31st, and we got 27 cars in various stages of production, this is 5% complete, this one's 95% complete, that's part of inventory that goes on the balance sheet. When we finish the production process, this is finished goods inventory. Okay, they're done. They're, there's a car waiting for an owner. Okay, but we haven't sold it yet. So it's still inventory. So in a manufacturing company, we have three different types of inventories. We got raw materials inventory. In the book just calls it materials inventory. Work and process inventory and finished goods inventory. Now, think back to financial accounting. You may or may not recall that when we sold inventory at the retail level, 
we had two different journal entries. Okay, we're not going to look at journal entries today, but we sold the inventory at the retail price and we debited cash or accounts receivable and we credited sales revenues. But we also debited cost of goods sold, which is an expense account on the income statement, the cost of the inventory sold, the cost of goods sold, and we credited inventory. And it's the same thing here. When we sell the inventory, it becomes an expense. Remember, cost of goods sold is an expense. It finally transfers to the income statement. Okay, so a product cost is first on the balance sheet, either as raw materials, work in process, or finished goods. And then when we sell it, it goes into cost of goods sold. We compare that to a period cost, which are the operating expenses, okay, which you may recall from financial accounting is selling expense and administrative expense, sometimes called, called selling general and administrative. Okay, and these are our operating expenses. Okay, and the reason we call them a period cost is because they don't go on the balance sheet. They go straight to the income statement a little further down. Okay, we're gonna look at an income statement at the end of this lecture, but just visualize sales or sales revenue minus cost of goods sold equals gross profit minus operating expenses. That's where these go. Equals operating income and then all that other stuff on the income statement. These never go on the balance sheet. A period cost goes straight to the income statement as operating expenses. So they show up in a different spot on the income statement. Product costs ultimately show up as cost of goods sold on the income statement. Operating expenses or period costs end up as operating expenses. Okay, so you want to draw that distinct distinction. If I incur a product cost, it may end up on the balance sheet in one month and the income statement the following month. Whatever month I incur a period cost goes straight to the income statement. Okay, so try to understand that concept. Okay, as mentioned uh, earlier, we have three types of inventory in a manufacturing environment, raw materials, work in process, and finished goods. Finished goods is the equivalent to merchandise inventory in a retail operation. It's the same thing because it's finished. Now we're going to sell it either to a distributor or a wholesaler who in turn will sell it to a retailer and they sell it to us. That's the typical uh, chain of events. You get it from a manufacturer, distributor, retailer, consumer. Okay, so three types of inventory uh, in a manufacturing environment. Okay, here's that uh, equation I made reference to and then we're going to do an example of this. Okay. This is what's called cost of goods manufactured and then cost of goods sold. Now I need to erase the board for a moment, or part of it anyway. I'll make it all. You may recall in a retail business, sales minus cost of goods sold equals gross profit minus operating expense equals operating income. Okay, and then we have more on the income statement, but that's not really our discussion here. And you may also recall what's called the cost of goods sold equation, which is beginning inventory, say on January 1st, plus purchases of inventory that we made this period equals cost of goods available for sale. And I usually just call this CGA. From this we subtract ending inventory, say on December 31st, and that will give us cost of goods sold, the cost of the inventory that we sold. This is the cost of goods sold equation in a retail environment. Now, believe it or not, this big formula you're staring at on the PowerPoint slide relates to this, because we're not purchasing inventory. Walmart is a retailer. They purchase finished goods from a variety of sources. Okay, here we are manufacturing 
So the difference, believe it or not, is that in a manufacturing environment, instead of purchases, we have cost of goods manufactured. So now I want to walk you through this formula. And what I always say in my classes, and this is, this is probably my best example, is if all you do is memorize this formula, you're in trouble. Is, as you can see, there's a lot of stuff here. Okay? And if you memorize, memorize it without thinking, what is this telling me? What, what, what does this represent? You're going to get confused. That's a lot of stuff to memorize. I'm not saying you can't, but uh, try to understand what the information is telling us. Okay? So I'm going to break this down kind of into subsections. And I want you to just, <clears throat> you know, you can hit pause, you can hit rewind, whatever you want to do. Let's just take a look at this and see what it's telling us. Now remember, three types of inventory. Raw materials, work in process, finished goods. We're going to see how these three types of inventory end up in this equation. First, uh, it's not on the board anymore, but raw materials enter production where we add labor and overhead. When we finish production, they become finished goods, cost of goods sold. Bear that in mind. We start with raw materials beginning inventory. In fact, you're going to recognize some patterns here. Raw materials beginning inventory plus purchases of raw materials made this period. Okay, so if I'm General Motors, I buy lots and lots of raw materials or parts to build the car. And what we had at the beginning of the period plus what we purchased is what we have available for use in production, because bear in mind, this is a manufacturing environment that we're looking at. At the end of the period, we count our raw materials ending inventory. We still have it, so we obviously haven't used it in production. So we subtract ending raw materials inventory, and that gives us raw materials used in production this period. Okay, And again, if you just walk yourself through that thought process, it makes sense. It's, it's really telling us the exact same thing that this equation is telling us. Okay, so now we have the amount of raw materials that have been used in production, let's just say this month, this year. Three product costs, raw materials plus direct labor plus manufacturing overhead, which, by the way, includes indirect materials and indirect labor, so it's all in there. Here are my three product costs, materials, labor and overhead, and this equals total manufacturing costs incurred this period. These are all the costs we introduced into production this year. Okay, Materials, because we can inventory materials, we had to go through that top equation, beginning inventory, which again was last year's ending inventory. So this year's beginning inventory plus what we bought is everything that was available for, for production minus ending inventory, which wasn't used in production, we still have it, gives me raw materials used in production this period. We add labor, we don't put our people in the refrigerator overnight, they're not inventory, so we just simply add labor. We add overhead, which is depreciation, it's the utilities, it's the indirect materials and labor, it's all those other costs we identified earlier related to the factory, and that's the total manufacturing costs, materials, labor, and overhead that we incurred this period in production. Okay, that's part one. Now, raw materials, work in process, right? And then finished goods. Now let's introduce work in process. Total manufacturing cost incurred, we added them this period. Think of it, we added it. We introduced it this period. But if this is not our first year in business, then on December 31st of last year, when the clock struck 5, 8, live 5 p.m. and everyone left for the day, we had work in process on the assembly line. Now think about it. Last year's ending inventory for work in process, those costs were incurred last period. They were introduced to production last period, last year. Well, they're carrying over into this year. And we can't ignore them. They're part of the cost of the car we're manufacturing or whatever it is we're manufacturing. So we take total manufacturing costs incurred this period. We add to that work in process beginning inventory. Because those are costs 
that were added last period, but they're crossing over into this period, and we have to keep building those units. Okay, now an assembly line is a first in, first out process. We gotta finish these beginning whip cars first, then we're gonna start and complete a bunch of other cars, and then at the end of this current period, we'll start some cars or start some product, but we won't finish it, and that'll be ending work in process. So total manufacturing costs incurred this period, plus beginning work in process inventory, which again, we inherited from last period, that equals all costs that were in work in process this period. And again, I know this is a big equation. Stop, pause, rewind, whatever. Think about what's going on, okay? First, we had the raw material. Now we're looking at the work in process, and we'll look at finished goods next. Okay, total manufacturing costs added this period, plus beginning whip equals all the costs that we, in, we had going through work in process this period. What we inherited from last period, partially completed units, plus everything we added this period. End of this year, we will have partially completed units on the assembly line. That'll be ending work in process for this period. Okay? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna subtract ending whip because we're trying to calculate cost of goods manufactured. And notice I put after it, and it's not really part of its official name, it simply adds explanation. Cost of goods manufactured this period and transferred to finished goods. Raw materials, work in process, flows into finished goods. And that's what just happened here. Cost of goods manufactured are all the units that we completed. They're 100% finished. We finished beginning whip first, first in, first out. And we started and finished many other units this period. At the end of this year, we started some units, but we have not yet finished them, so we're not including those units. We're subtracting ending work in process inventory on December 31st from all costs that were in WIP this period, and that gives us cost of goods manufactured and transferred out of work in process into finished goods inventory. And that's the cost of goods manufactured equation. In the next lecture, we're gonna actually see the journal entries how all these costs get captured in the accounting system and flow through the accounting process. But wait, there's more, as they say. We're at cost of goods manufactured. We've addressed the raw materials inventory. We've addressed the work and process inventory. Now we gotta add finished goods into the mix to ultimately come up with cost of goods sold, okay? So, cost of goods manufactured and transferred into finished goods. So these are now in the finished goods warehouse. January 1st, 8 in the morning, we have finished goods beginning inventory. These were cars that were finished in a previous period that have not yet been sold. Sometimes inventory levels start to build if demand slows down. Okay, so cost of goods manufactured plus all the cars or product that was in beginning finished goods on January 1st is cost of goods or inventory available for sale, right here. Instead of purchases, we can now just say, beginning inventory, finished goods, plus cost of goods manufactured equals cost of goods available for sale, minus this year's ending finished goods inventory will give us cost of goods sold, which goes on the income statement, okay? So there's a lot of information there, I know that. But if you break it down, kind of think of it, break it down into the three sections relating to inventory. Raw materials inventory, which goes from beginning inventory down to raw materials used in production. We add labor and overhead to get total manufacturing costs. Then we factor in work and process. Total manufacturing costs plus beginning whip. Minus ending whip gives us cost of goods manufactured. And then we look at finished goods inventory. Cost of goods manufactured plus beginning finished goods minus ending finished goods gives us cost of goods sold. Okay, so break it down into manageable parts. Okay, and here's our income statement. And this is no different than what I put on the board. Sales revenue minus cost of goods sold. And in a manufacturing environment, it includes our product costs, direct materials, direct labor, and overhead. And again, overhead includes 
indirect materials, indirect labor, and all the other production-related costs. Sales minus cost of goods sold equals gross profit. It's gross profit minus our operating expenses, which we refer to as period costs, to draw a distinction between product costs and period costs. Equals operating income. Then you may recall from financial accounting, we had other types of revenues and gains, things like interest revenue, rent revenue, gain on sale of equipment, other expenses and losses, interest expense, loss on sale of equipment. Gives us income before tax, multiply income before tax, times your tax rate, say 30%, that gives you your tax expense. Income before tax minus tax expense gives you net income, okay? And that's really be a little beyond the focus of what we're talking about here. This is right out of your book from chapter 16. Here's an example of cost of goods manufactured. Cost of data for Bedford Manufacturing Company for the month ending May 31st is as follows. Prepare cost of goods manufactured, determine cost of goods sold. Now I do want to say, there's more than one way to prepare this schedule. And in managerial accounting, unlike financial accounting, you don't have to stick to a rigid formula or format. You can prepare a schedule almost any way, the, any way you want as long as people can understand it and make decisions from it. Okay, so the way that I prepare the schedule is correct, but your book and more importantly your homework, which is on a computer, may ask for it in a different format. Okay, so uh, be careful. Okay, but I just want to show you how we're going to do this. Okay, now if you remember the previous slide, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use the same format. I'm going to say raw materials beginning inventory may 1st 168000 whoops plus purchases of raw material if we go down a little further somewhere in there materials purchased 302 equals raw materials available for production, and that's going to give me 470. Okay, I have my solution in front of me to save me some time doing the math here. I better have that in front of me. Okay, then we're going to subtract raw materials ending inventory from May 31st, which is 139,000. And I always like to put brackets around numbers I'm going to subtract. And this equals raw materials used in production. Okay, and that number is 331. Okay, so there's raw materials used in production. Plus direct labor of 475. Okay, and now I'm going to abbreviate here overhead and if we add up all those overhead costs and let's just identify them indirect labor machinery depreciation heat light and power supplies property tax and miscellaneous production related costs that comes to 144200 okay now you should list them out if you're preparing a schedule like this i can't because i'm, I'm going to run out of board space okay and that's going to give us total manufacturing costs 950,200 equals total, I'm going to abbreviate, manufacturing cost incurred this period, 950,200. Okay, now we go back and we add in work in process plus beginning work in process inventory. Okay, or beginning WIP, beginning inventory, whatever you want to call it, and that's 240. equals all costs in work in process and let's see zero nine one million one ninety two hundred minus ending work in process inventory from May thirty first which is two sixty Okay, and this gives us, I'm going to abbreviate, cost of goods manufactured, and that's 930,200. Okay, so there is cost of goods manufactured right there. 
And now we're going to finish it by looking at cost of goods sold. So I'm going to add beginning finished goods inventory. And again, just think of a car. Okay, think of all the all the individual parts that make up a car, raw materials. Think of a car partially complete at various stages of completion. You can't drive it yet, it's not finished. That's work in process. And then a finished car, finished goods. Okay, beginning finished goods inventory, we got 182,000. And this equals, I'm gonna abbreviate again, cost of goods available for sale, and that's 1,112,200. From this, we subtract ending inventory for finished goods. This is the completed cars that have not yet been sold to the dealerships, 214,200. And at long last, cost of goods sold, which goes on the income statement of 898,000. And then on the income statement, we'll have sales revenue minus cost of goods sold equals gross profit minus our period cost, operating expenses, operating income, et cetera. Okay, those are the primary concepts for uh, this first chapter. We're talking about introduction to managerial accounting. Get to know the various different components that we talked about. Get to know your formula, and you'll be in a good spot going forward. That's it.